Todd and Joel, who are here with us and have been very patient with us. And we thank you all for your patience, but we're excited to be here tonight. So please help me welcome Joel and Todd. I'm, I'm so glad I had the air conditioning turned up in my uh, <laughs> office here. I was breaking quite a sweat. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys for uh, for hanging out and uh, 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 tolerating the, the wait there. I really appreciate it. Uh, so Todd and I are going to be talking about um, an important topic in the field of gifted education that I think we're all grappling with uh, is the idea of how do we promote greater equity in our gifted education programs. And what we are going to be talking about is one tool for, uh, for creating equity in our identification procedures. Uh, let, but before we go into talking about the tool and talking about some of the ways that we can approach identification uh, and equity in, in our, our field, let me give you the most recent definition of gifted and talented from the National Association for Gifted Children. So with, with this definition, uh, let, me, let me kind of walk you through it. Students who are gifted and talented, students with gifts and talents perform and I, this is my emphasis, or have the capability to perform at higher levels compared to others of the same age, experience, and environment. Now, those there are two really important parts of that, that definition. The first is that we're, we're trying to find the kids who have the capability to perform at um, or the potential to perform in it. Those are two different groups of kids. You know, and, and Todd and I were joking before we started this conversation, the kids who are performing at the very highest levels are the ones who, they're pretty easy to find. They're performing at the highest levels. What we're after are the kids that are capable with the proper interventions of performing at the highest levels. And one of the ways that we're gonna, the other piece of this is that we're gonna find those kids by comparing them to other kids in their, their peer group. Uh, we're not looking for um, uh, we're, we're, kids who come from poverty are going to be compared to kids who come from poverty. And we're going to be looking at those kids that are the rising stars there because they haven't been given the same opportunities to learn that some other kids have. But the top performers in that group are, 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 are have the capability to perform at the highest levels. Let me come back to this um, tell you what a behavior rating scale is. So a behavior rating scale is one of the oldest assessment tools that we use in mental health and in education and research. Uh, let me give you an example of one that we, uh, that, that you'll, any parent is familiar with. This is the, uh, the CDC uh, behavior checklist that uh, your baby at two months. Uh, the thing to note about this is anytime you've got an observational behavior checklist, all of the behaviors listed are discrete behaviors that you can see. And, and this is kind of an important point that you'll see uh, when we're talking about the gifted identifying uh, scales. You don't have to have special training in giftedness to be able to see one of these behaviors. In other words, you don't have to be an expert in early childhood to look at one of these behaviors and see, well, the baby begins to smile at people. That's an observable behavior. You don't have to have special training in, in that. And that's going to be true of the, uh, the gifted scales as well. So let me give you some examples of the kind of items that are on a gifted scale. Uh, one of them that's not on here, but it's a really good one, is just, you know, it reads above grade level. That's the sort of thing that any general education teacher uh, can see. And the, 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 the teacher rates the child one to five when compared to peers, to what degree do they exhibit this behavior? So here's just some from the scales for identifying gifted students. We've got establishes cause and effect relationships easily, uh, enjoys talking about ideas or feelings generated by what is read or what is read to him or her, uh, easily distinguishes between relevant and irrelevant information in mathematical problems, and can apply uh, a scientific finding from one situation to another. In other words, see, notice that those are all general ed type questions. A, a general ed teacher can complete these forms just fine. And they, uh, uh, they're really good sources of information. And one of the things that's really powerful, and Todd's gonna to talk about this in a little bit, is they're in the classroom with those kids. So they're seeing how kids are progressing uh, in the classroom and they can see who the rising stars and among different populations of kids are on, on these items. So let, let me show you. Uh, so Todd is one of the co-authors of the most recent revision of the SIGs and uh, the, the scales for identifying gifted students, which we'll talk about later. 
this is how uh, he's, he helps the teacher see that what we're wanting to get is uh, kids being compared to their peer group. So he'll always ask, he'll, he'll state the, the actual behavior, but before there, they're gonna to say, to what degree does a student exhibit the behavior listed when compared with his or her grade peers? And then Todd and his uh, co-author Layla and wife uh, go on to uh, specify what is a peer group. Peers are defined as students of similar age, background and social status. So that's, that's how we're getting at those kids that have the capability to perform at the highest levels, but aren't there yet. And I'm going to ask Todd to talk about that in a little bit, but I, I want to tell you the reason that I want to get at those different, different kind of peer groups. And the reason I want to limit what I'm asking the teachers not to, well, who do you think the gifted kids in the classroom are? What I want those teachers to do is tell me to what degree does this child read above grade level? So I want, I want to take the whole concept of giftedness out of this, this instrument that they're completing. And I want to show you why. So right now, if you go do a Google search and, and Google image search, and you just say, you know, who are the gifted kids, right? Uh, and you've heard this, teachers say, oh, I, I know who the gifted kids are, I can see them in my classroom. And if you ask them, oh boy, this is one that we really wanna move away from if we have the opportunity over time is move away from uh, uh, nomination forms where we say, who should we test for our gifted program? In other words, who looks like a gifted kid? Because we're only gonna test those kids to see if they, they qualify for the gifted program. Well, when you ask Google the same question, do an image search to Google, and Google's only reflective of our you know, crystallized notions of what giftedness means, here's our answer. Well, it looks pretty white and it looks pretty male. Mm -hmm. That's why we wanna move away from this idea of nominating for the gifted program or asking people who are the gifted folks. You know, The idea of like, let's try to look at discrete behaviors and have teachers rate the kids in, in terms of the degree to which they exhibit those behaviors um, uh, when compared to their peers is a powerful way for us to gather additional information about, about kids. Todd, maybe talk a little bit about what you found when you were uh, when you were collecting data from the teachers about the accuracy of, of th their ability to find those gifted kids. Yeah, Jill, thank you. Uh, it's a great question. Thank you for having me as part of this conversation tonight. Um, one, of, one of the things that is remarkable about the, the original SIGs uh, and the SIGs II, our, our revision and renorming, is uh, we have a really high consistency. We, we uh, evaluate consistency of uh, teacher responses uh, with a metric called reliability. Uh, I think people in assessment uh, and gifted education and, and, and maybe education in general are familiar with the concept of reliability. It's, uh, it's how consistently uh, individuals uh, who complete a form uh, you know, do it over time, you know, test, retest, uh, uh, and then uh, 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 rate the students consistently uh, based on the prompts. We have incredibly high uh, reliability on the SIGs too, uh, as well as the original SIGs uh, above not, uh, 0 0.90. Uh, and in most cases, we would generally consider even above 0 0.80 uh, a high level of reliability or uh, certainly accepted for uh, assessments. But uh, what we found is, that is, 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 and if you ask me, well, why do you think that we have such a high reliability? And I think it's because uh, great care uh, was taken to write really clear statements of the behavior. So a teacher uh, or a uh, parent or guardian uh, using the home forms as well, would be able to read that statement and ask the question uh, of him or herself, uh, you know, does this student that I'm rating exhibit that behavior about the same or more or less than other students who would be considered a peer group? So I think the, the key there is, is just what you mentioned, Jill, write very clear statements of a behavior so that uh, the, uh, the person completing the form can read that statement without any specialized training and think about, okay, this child uh, either does or doesn't exhibit that behavior um, uh, 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 more or less than uh, peer groups. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And, and, and the reason we keep like harping on this peer group thing, and, and certainly, you know, we just released a, a, at Proofrock, we just released a book called Unlocking Potential that focuses on kids from low income households. 
uh, the, the opportunities to learn put those kids at a deficit the, the day they walk through the classroom. And let, let me throw up this, this real quick slide here because I wanted to talk about a few of the reasons why traditional me mis me measures can mismeasure <laughs> our, our kids. Uh, when you've got kids, pr particularly kids from low SDS, they come to school with a restricted opportunity to learn school-related skills and knowledge. They know a lot of things about a lot of stuff. But, but those academic skills, they may not have been exposed to some of those academic skills. And it's gonna take them a few years to get to the point where they're competitive with kids from high SES environments. Um, they've had limited exposure to test format and methods of assessing aptitude. And I, I'll tell you as a publisher, this is a little secret that's kind of like a, one of those things that I found out and I thought, oh man, this is a this is awful. Uh, one of the most successful books in the category, Gifted Education in Amazon, is uh, it's essentially a test prep book for uh, COGAT. In other words, uh, it's it's there. There's a group of parents that are going out and they're buying test prep books mm -hmm. in first and second grade for their kids because they know they're going to take that COGAT in the second grade. And they're drilling those kids in the test format. They're giving them practice in analogical thinking. They're giving them practice in, in, uh, um, in uh, the different kinds of thinking skills that are tested for on those instruments. Those kids are coming in at a way higher level in terms of their ability to score on those tests than you know kids who are coming from backgrounds where they've not been exposed to those kind of things. You've got kids with limited English language skills here in Texas. I mean, it's certainly down in the Southwest, this is, and well, throughout the country, but certainly we're, we're grappling with that here in, in the Southwest in Texas. Uh, kids with limited English language skills don't perform as well typically on a verbal test. That it, it's just by their nature, they're coming in a deficit. And also if you've got a kid who's, you know, let's say they're incredibly intelligent, but they're also, they have a learning disability or they have some other reason, a, a twice exceptionality that prevents their performance in, in the classroom. Traditional measures are, are gonna be very poor at picking those kinds of kids up. But teachers are very good at picking those kids up because they can see the progress they're making in the classroom and compare it to others. So let me, I just, before I, I know, I feel like I'm, I'm sort of hogging the stage here, but, I, but I, I, I wanted to clarify some of these key points here is we're not suggesting that a behavior observation scale is the only way that you would identify gifted kids. It is just a better way of identifying some of those kids that, um, that have the potential to perform, but are not currently performing at the highest levels. And I gave a few examples here. A kid with dysgraphia might perform poorly on a standardized math assessment, but perform well in her classroom where the teacher gives extra time and allows for verbal responses. The teacher's making those accommodations so that teacher knows that the kid has those abilities. So if you give the behavior rating scale to the teacher, she's a better rater than say a COGAD or sort of a, 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 a math achievement assessment. Mm -hmm. a, a child with an English, who's an English language learner might not perform well on a standardized verbal aptitude test, but her teacher might see her making significant gains in the classroom. But let me give you an example where behavior rating skill is not gonna work so well. You've got, a, you've got a sort of an unchallenged, undifferentiated classroom, and you've got a child in there who's at the 99th percentile in math. That teacher's never going to be able to see the, t the kid performing at those highest levels because the only material that the, the kid's going to be performing on are on grade level uh, math materials. So I'm going to get off this, this horse of mine, and, uh, uh, but I want to read a quote, and then I'm going to reflect it back to Todd a little bit. Um, here's a quote from one of the teachers who completed one of the forms, and he was, he was writing about a child, John, who had recently moved from Mexico, and he felt like he needed to explicate why uh, he was scoring John so highly when John's test scores didn't necessarily reflect, um, uh, re reflect uh, John's skill set and abilities. So here's, here's the quote from uh, the teacher. Despite John's recent move to the United States from Mexico, hence his lack of exposure to American history, he's extremely curious about the world and, and understanding of how American government works. He's also engaged and asked wonderful thought-provoking questions that highlight his in-depth understanding of the topic of history. John has offered to help students in the class who are language learners because, quote, quote he understands what that feels like. He is a sought after group member and a leader in the class. In math, John tied together slope and math much quicker than the other students. And long before I started making the connection for the kids, he has already showed great growth in reading, writing, and speaking. His thinking is an advanced level. So 
that teacher sees this incredible progress in the classroom. But if we just take a snapshot uh, with, a, with a standardized measure, we're not going to capture that talent that John has. And, and, and Todd, maybe you can talk about that. that. Like these observation scales are essentially, you know, they're, they're, they're a, a, an a, authentic assessment of a child's performance that's different than other kinds of measures. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, well, one of the ways I like to distinguish it, Joel, is it's the, um, it's the difference between a performance measure uh, and, and, um, and an observation or an interpretation measurement. Uh, whereas a test is a performance measure, uh, some, uh, someone who observes uh, and describes the kid's behavior or rates the kid's behavior, uh, that's more of an interpretive uh, act. Well, what we find is uh, as parents uh, who are around their children and, and observe behaviors, as well as teachers who uh, spend a great deal of time observing kids uh, in the act of learning or, or trying to make sense of new information, uh, are actually in a, in a tremendous position to estimate a kid's potential uh, in a way that might not be reflected on a standardized test. And you said this a moment ago, uh, I mean, no, in, in no way do we recommend the behavior rating skill as the only way you would do gifted identification. We, uh, we recommend it as a tool uh, that can be used in a uh, battery of assessments. Uh, and the reason is, is it gives us a different perspective. It is somebody who, uh, it is a perspective of someone who is obs actively observing the student perform uh, with other students of similar age experience and environment uh, who can make some valid, uh, and that observer can make some valid assessments of the kids' um, uh, capacities. So uh, if you want to, I, I like to think of it like this, is like uh, however a kid scores on a test, uh, that is a, uh, that's a performance, right? That, that's what we call a performance. Um, but a, a teacher can observe a process uh, that isn't uh, reflected on, you know, a standardized test, right? Uh, I mean, it, you know, even, you know, the best standardized tests that we have don't do uh, a, a good job at all of reflecting student proce uh, process. Uh, so if you want to think about it, uh, the old, um, I bet every, anybody who's listening here probably remembers uh, back in the day, you had a math teacher that wanted you to show your work. Uh, and uh, I, I, I know very few people who love showing their work. Uh, but if you if you ask a math teacher, why do you want the student to uh, show his or her work? Uh, and, and usually the math teacher will say, well, even if the kid gets the answer wrong, what I want to know is what process did he or she go through uh, trying to solve the problem? Because I can make some assessments about that student's math capacity by looking at the process, even if that kid gets the answer wrong. And, and my suggestion is uh, that's like a micro version of exactly why we would use a behavior rating scale. Uh, like getting the answer wrong is kind of like scoring a, a above average, but not exceptional uh, score on, uh, say, a standardized uh, test of cognitive ability. Uh, but uh, if the teacher uh, uses a rating scale and can capture the process of uh, how that student thinks and interacts with new ideas and concepts uh, and uh, uh, makes cause and effect connections, just like the examples you sh uh, were showing earlier, uh, then that gives us a tremendous amount of insight into that student's capacity. Uh, and, and most teachers would believe that, you know, with a little more practice, the kid's going to start getting the answers right. Because if you've got the right process, it's just a matter of time before the final performance is going to match the process. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's why I uh, am a, a big believer in the behavior rating scale, because it gives us a different picture of what the kid can do. Uh, and in some ways, I would argue a more authentic picture of what the kid can do. Yeah, and so and, you know that's you know comes back to some of the things we've talked about in in, in gifted land. You know, of, of, you know when we're trying to find those kids, both the kids performing at the highest levels and those that have the potential to perform at the highest levels, we're using multiple measures. We're going to be looking at IQ. We'll look at uh, achievement measures. We'll look at classroom performance. We'll even look at uh, you know product portfolios. There's a lot of ways we can collect data, but the reason you're doing that is that. You know, in this new conception of, you know, we're a talent development programs where we're wanting to find kids that exhibit a passion for a thing and help those kids excel in those, the, those kinds of things. Our, our instruments shouldn't be gatekeepers. They ought to be turning us as, as teachers and coordinators into talent scouts for some of the most talented kids out there. What, what are your thoughts about that, Todd? I, I think it's, uh, that's a, a great point, Joel. One, um... One of the things that you know about me that others might not is I've spent more than my fair share of time around uh, the game of baseball. 
Uh, I'm a big baseball fan. I've uh, coached baseball for years and uh, raised uh, kids who played baseball. Uh, and then uh, one of the things that I've uh, observed quite uh, often in baseball, and, and even at the highest levels, let's say uh, if a college uh, is going to consider uh, a kid for you know bringing into a baseball team, put on scholarship at, at the at the college level, or even uh, uh, professional baseball scouts who are uh, interested in a college player or a high school player, and, and they may want to you know consider that kid for the draft. Almost in every case, uh, they ask the coach. Uh, to give a, uh, an assessment of the kid's performance. Uh, and I would say, well, why? Well, it's really high stakes, right? If, if you're going to sign a kid uh, in the major league draft and you're going to, and maybe that kid's going to get a, a million dollar signing bonus, well, you don't want to, you know, make a mistake. So I would say when, in cases where uh, in, in real life, uh, beyond school situations, people are trying to assess talent and potential. One of the primary ways they do it is ask the person who's observing that kid on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, how does he practice? What does he look like uh, when he's doing drills? Uh, what does he look like when he's failing? Uh, because it's easy to see someone perform at a high level, but what I, you know, they may also wanna know like, what do you look like when you're in a struggle, right? And so, uh, so I, I, and I think the same applies in the fine arts. Uh, if you look at the fine arts, if uh, some if, uh, um, individuals applying to, you know, elite fine art programs, you know, Juilliards and other uh, programs of the world, uh, more often than not, uh, they're going to ask to observe um, uh, a performance, and they may ask people who have been instructors and teachers uh, to rate uh, that student's capacity uh, based on their observations. Uh, so I think the, the tradition of a, a person who has uh, close knowledge of a, a student's work habits, uh, perf uh, process skills, that tradition goes beyond math and science and language arts and social studies. That, that tradition goes into many of our uh, uh, performance domains in which uh, uh, people are really trying to find talent. And so just like you said, if we're trying to find talent, we wanna look deeper than just the performance. We'd like to look at uh, the, uh, uh, the process that might go behind it. Yeah, and if those of you who are with us, if if the, so, the foundation of some of the stuff that Todd and I are talking about is a a, a book called uh, uh, Frame, Frameworks for Talent Development that mm -hmm. uh, our friend Paula Ojewski Kubilis at Northwestern University, uh, Rena Savodnik at the American Psychological Association, and Frank Worrell out, out at Berkeley uh, have pulled together, and it's this new, really a new vision for gifted education as a talent development program, and in in that realm. You, potentially the, the gifted program is, is, is changed into something that's not just narrowly defined in specific, like very narrow academic areas. We're looking for talents. A kid might be talented in language arts, but not so much in mathematics. A kid might need special interventions in advanced sciences, but not so much in the language arts program. And so it becomes, uh, we're, we're looking for where does that child exhibit performance? And, and we'll bring them into the program. So there's two pieces of that. And maybe, maybe Todd, you can talk a little bit about that is, um, but um, the, the two pieces of, of one is that sort of asymmetrical profile. Some, some kids are gonna be very good at certain things, but not good at everything. And it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to bring a kid into a, you know, the old fashioned, you know, gifted program where they have all of their services uh, in, in the gifted program when you know, we're, we're really finding those talent areas are, are very asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. The other thing too is, and I, and I, I said, I, I've been playing with this idea of, well, if you come, I mean, I've been here and you too, Todd and I met each other in graduate school. So we've been in this for many years. If you've been here 31 years, you know how the field has, has changed. I think when we first started, um, get the gift, the gifted kids looked a certain way. They looked a lot like that Google search, you know, and, and your challenge was maybe our biggest challenge was finding the, the most advanced curriculum that we could challenge kids with. Well, now this new idea of, of, of a more equitable identification program of a more talent uh, uh, wider net that we're throwing means that we're doing a lot of other things too. We're helping bring kids up to speed. We're introducing kids who hadn't been introduced to, to, to a certain forms of academics. Maybe we have we have whole area, like you follow Joe Renzulli's in, in, enrichment model. We're exposing kids to all kinds of opportunities where they could find a passion. And, and the behavior scales are giving you one tool for that process. Um, does, that, does that ring true, Todd? Yeah, it, it does ring true, and, and I think we're 
Uh, I, I'm just going to, I'll be as honest as I can about this, Joel. I, I think um, we have to, we have to solve some of our inequity problems. Um, just, I mean, have to, it's not optional. Uh, I, I, I had, uh, uh, I had someone pose a question to me today. Uh, and, the, and the question was, uh, can gifted education overcome its dubious past uh, and uh, continue to be part of our educational systems in the United States? Uh, and, and, if you, and if you think about that question, can we remain viable uh, in spite of our dubious past? Well, what's the dubious past? Well, the dubious past is the Google search image. The dubious past is that even today, when you look at our programs, uh, they mostly reflect uh, affluence uh, and educational opportunity uh, with very little equity and uh, uh, in uh, terms of economics, uh, ethnicity, and race. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think it's optional to keep uh, proceeding uh, in the standard course. So one of the things that we have to start doing is uh, looking for what does talent look like and it's uh, our potential look like in its earliest manifestations. So we find these kids that may have not had e uh, educational opportunity like you described earlier, but yet we can see through some of these behaviors and these pr uh, processes that the kids may go through in very authentic learning situations. Uh, and we can identify which kids have that type of potential uh, so that we can uh, uh, overcome the challenges that are presented by this concept of uh, educational opportunity or more specifically lack of educational opportunity. And uh, so I, I think that's one of the reasons that we, we look at tools like behavioral rating scales because they can get uh, to, uh, they, they can uh, provide a tool for teachers to systematically observe uh, and, and identify behaviors that reflect potential. And that allows us to say, you know what, we're going to uh, expand these uh, programs. We're going to uh, look for kids that have um, uh, maybe atypical or uneven profiles like you demonstrated. And I would, I would say that a tool like the 6-2 uh, does a good job of identifying specific talent areas and strength areas because uh, it allows us to get ratings on uh, all the four core areas as well as leadership and creativity. Uh, and uh, uh, general intellectual ability. So it's not just for identifying, it's also for creating the profiles so that we then design customized programs that are matched to those profiles rather than assuming that a one size fits all gifted education uh, is a very reasonable uh, at this time of customized educational uh, uh, opportunity. So um, so yeah, I, I think your, uh, your description of um, uh, why the, you know, this sort of confluence of uh, talent development theories, uh, needing to uh, look for potential as well as actual performance. Uh, but I, I think I, I just want to be very clear that it's no longer optional to uh, be inequitable. Uh, that is, um, uh, I, I think that's a chapter of gifted education we have to leave behind. And we have to see a future uh, where we're finding kids that represent uh, diverse potential uh, in all manifestations. Uh, and the truth is we know how to develop that diverse potential. Uh, uh, the, the part of gifted education in this hundred year history that we have that uh, we are uh, bringing forward uh, uh, still today is that we've learned a lot about developing potential uh, into exceptional performances as kids uh, develop and mature over time. So we're gonna take that science of uh, how to develop exceptional performance and combine it with more inclusive uh, identification practices that are uh, capable of seeing potential as well as uh, those who are already performing at uh, high levels. Mm -hmm. let, let me, let me, since you, we've, at this point, I'm gonna take over and, and show a product since that's my job. <laughs> this, here's, here's the three rating scales that we have. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Todd share a little bit about, um, uh, about his work on the, the, the revision of the scales for identifying gifted students. Uh, and by the way, for those of you using that, I know we've got a lot of school districts in, in Colorado that use the scales for identifying gifted students. We will be releasing the SIGS two, the one that Todd has worked on. Uh, in April, the print version, and then we'll roll out the, the online version to everyone uh, on August 1st. So if you're using the, the online version, you'll automatically roll into the SIGS to August 1st. If you want to uh, start getting the, the paper forms and reviewing them, uh, those will be available April 1st. We have the HOPE teacher rating scale and the Renzulli scale. And I'm not, I'm going to, let me take you over real quickly 
uh, to a, a web page. This is the Proofrock Press website. This is proofrock.com. Watch what I do here. I'm going to come here to webinars and I'm going to click that. If you come into the uh, past webinars, you can find a whole section of uh, webinars that uh, that are on the topic of behavior rating skills. You just come down here. And I did, I did a couple with uh, Dr. Sanguris uh, on this topic and we talk about local norms, but we also do this deep dive into behavior rating scales and the, the qualities of each of the different rating scales uh, that we have. So I, I think that's, if you're, if you're interested in what's the difference between the HOPE scale and the Renzulli scale and the, the scales for identifying gifted students, uh, I'd ask you to go it, it, read the product pages, you know, obviously, but then also those webinars, that's what they're there for. They're supposed to be, you know, informational. I, I walked through with uh, Dr. Sangura some of the data collection that, they, that Todd and Layla did. Uh, and it, it, it's a really nice informative uh, piece. So if you go watch that webinar, I'd, I'd recommend that. Um, and then Todd, maybe I was going to put you on the spot because I didn't, we didn't have this as a, a question, but I, I'm curious, as you collected data for the SIGs too, uh, were there any surprises, anything that stood out for you that you hadn't expected to, to learn? Uh, I would say one of my uh, uh, most pleasant surprises was it was more equitable than I expected. Uh, because, uh, and maybe I've just been uh, jaded after, like you said, 31 years uh, of uh, this type of work where uh, we, we have come to grow, uh, unfortunately, uncomfortable with inequitable uh, outcomes. Uh, but uh, uh, we found amazing equity and we had large samples. I mean, we, we had, uh, I don't remember exactly, but uh, you know, 50,000 plus uh, sample size in our norming uh, population. And uh, and we had an exact replica uh, of the demographics of the U.S. Uh, population. So, uh, in terms of uh, race, ethnicity, male, female, uh, I mean, and we 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 worked very hard to get a representative sample. Uh, and when we looked at the scores, we used uh, uh, statistical tools like differential uh, item functioning. Uh, and, and that's certainly a, a complex metric to identify whether an item performs differently for uh, male, female, or uh, for black students versus Hispanic students versus uh, white students or Asian students. So, so we, um, we used those tools and we found no evidence of uh, differential uh, performance uh, on the items, which is uh, very encouraging. And I know that uh, the, the original SIGs had done some of that testing as well, and they'd found a similar results. So, uh, uh, so we were uh, incredibly happy with that result. But even beyond that, when we just reported the means, right? Like, so uh, let's say we, you know, we could look at uh, all the elementary students and we could compare students who are Hispanic with students who were not Hispanic. Uh, and there's uh, almost identical means. Like there's no difference between the kids who were Hispanic uh, and the kids who are uh, uh, not non-Hispanic. In, in fact, uh, the, uh, the 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 slight difference actually favored the kids who were uh, Hispanic. So, uh, my 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 point is, uh, I, I believe every school district should be asking how well does any identification instrument help us achieve our equity mission when we're doing our identification uh, practices, uh, and uh, I was in, uh, very happy that uh, our our data analysis, like I said, with a large sample of, uh, of rating forms, uh, we found the, the SIGs yielded those kind of results that uh, it didn't matter if it was race uh, or ethnicity uh, or sex, the, uh, the uh, equity was a very important uh, outcome that we were hoping to have. And we actually had better equity than we expected. Uh, that, that that that's gratifying and I, I let me uh, that so you guys can see kind of the areas that the the SIGs looks at um, so what we're going to do is we're going to give the the observation scale to teachers now let's face it if, if our gifted education program does not service 
kids in leadership, for example. Well, we don't use the leadership scale. All of these are discrete scales. They stand, mm -hmm. they stand alone, you know, and, mm -hmm. and so you don't have to give all the, the scales to the teachers. What you typically do, because remember, we're looking for those talented kids, those areas of talent. We would give the instrument to the teacher where the kid is most likely to be performing at the best or at the highest levels. Uh, so this is, this is an area, uh, these are some of the items that, um, um, you know, Todd looked at. Um, Todd, in terms of the, the parents and the teachers, uh, what, what, did you find one group was more accurate than, than another at, 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 mm -hmm. at seeing the difference or comparing the kids? I don't think I can use the word accurate, Joel, because that presumes that there's one right answer and uh, one of them got closer to it. And uh, I would say that we have, uh, we get similar ratings uh, from uh, uh, parents and uh, teachers. Uh, and it's not unusual to have slight differences, partly because if you're a parent, you don't have as many times to observe uh, your kid compared to, you know, peer groups. I mean, you see, you may see your kid with some peers, but uh, not as many peers as the teacher would have access to. Especially in the last year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, and secondly, uh, oftentimes uh, teachers have uh, more opportunity to in observe kids engaged in academic processes uh, than their uh, parents would at home. So, uh, you know, unless you've got parents running science experiments at home on a regular basis with peers around so that you can see how your kid performs compared to those other, uh, those peers, they're not going to have much experience with that level of observation. But I will, I will say this, uh, we obviously we did a tremendous amount of uh, estimate of reliability, which is consistency. And we found that, uh, the teachers are slightly more consistent using the scales than parents, which is not surprising. We expected that result. That was consistent with uh, the original version of the SIGs uh, to some degree as well. Uh, but the, the uh, teachers are slightly more consistent than the parents, uh, but both of them, uh, but the parents also exceeded uh, you know, acceptable standards of reliability. And, I mean, they were still in the, uh, generally in the 90s. I think we had one or two scales where they were in the uh, upper 0.8. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, we were uh, certainly uh, pleased with how both groups' uh, data turned out. Uh, but like I said, I don't, I, I don't want to say one is more accurate than the other. They're both just observing kids in slightly different circumstances, and they both yield uh, valuable data when we're trying to uh, make determinations about uh, placement in gifted education. Mm, that, 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 that makes sense. Um, I, I was... But earlier, we had fielded a couple of questions from teachers, and, and I, I think we're, we're coming into the last uh, 15 minutes or so. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of posing this to the California, uh, Colorado Association for the Gift and Talented mm -hmm. Folks. If there's some Q&A that, uh, that you guys want to uh, bring to the forefront, um, uh, we'd love to hear that. But I, I know that there was one question beforehand from a teacher in the Colorado group that was asking about kids who are LD, ESL, uh, kids from low income houses. And maybe, you know, the question I think was, was implying that maybe those kids, because they're not already performing at the top levels, there may be behavior problems. Let's say a kid who's uh, ADHD, may, there may be some behavior problems in the classroom. How do you how do you invite teachers to look beyond that and look at the potential per performance for those kids? Is, is that something you guys dealt with with the 6-2? It is. Uh, we, uh, we did anticipate that. And one of, the, one of the things we included in the manual is uh, some uh, quite an quite a extensive section on how to help uh, school systems and teachers understand how to uh, uh, make those rating judgments. First of all, we're asking the teacher to compare kids to peers, right? So, uh, and that's very, very explicit in the uh, directions. Uh, so when we think about, well, what's a peer? So maybe a peer is a student who comes from similar social status, but that's technically how we defined it. So if you're thinking about uh, e uh, socioeconomics, you're looking at students from similar social status. Uh, but, but the other thing we write in terms of uh, like accommodations, for instance, is uh, we want teachers to rate how the kid performs in a learning environment where the accommodations are present. So if a kid is learning disabled or as uh, attention deficit disorder, uh, the whatever accommodations might go along with that diagnosis and those accommodations might be present in a 504 or an IEP, uh, we want the teacher to rate the kid in learning environments where the accommodations are being used. 
Uh, so in other words, we're accounting for the, the maybe the twice exceptional or the, the uh, limiting exceptionality because we assume that the com accommodations are being present when the teacher's observing the kid. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, I, and if, for the audience listening live, we, we can't see your questions, uh, but we really encourage you to pose mm -hmm. the questions because the, the Colorado Association folks, so Elizabeth in particular, we will be do. sharing your we questions with a, us. We have a bunch coming in. So if we're ready, are you ready to jump to some questions? Um, one of the questions we received from a member ahead of time had to do with the behavior rating scale and asking general education teachers to utilize the tool does there need to be some sort of training or what would be the best way to approach getting these into general education teachers' hands and then them using them appropriately or accurately? With the, the SIGs and, and the SIGs too as well, were validated uh, and shown to be valid without any special training on the part of the, the, the teachers or the parents for that matter. And it wouldn't really be practical to only be able to give this to the gifted mm -hmm. ed teachers. You want to find those kids from all those areas. Mm -hmm. But again, I, I don't know if so there were some, you know, I mentioned this at the beginning of the, the session. These are very discrete behaviors like off-level reading ability mm -hmm. uh, that that a teacher, a general ed teachers would see. You don't have to know anything about gifted to be able to answer that kind of a question. There was a case with the, so that is true of the HOPE scale and that is true of the SIGs and it is true of the SIGs too. Those of you using the uh, Renzulli scales, which are the scale, the, um, the, the Scripsis, um, that one has a little training program in there that takes about le less than an hour, but it's not to teach about giftedness. It's to establish integrator reliability, which mm -hmm. the other instruments did without the, the need for that. But, mm -hmm. uh, but no, I mean, it's a great question, but if you look at the items in, in the, in the SIGs in particular, it's very discreet behaviors that a kid would observe, er, exhibit in a classroom and a teacher would observe it. Does it, does that seem correct, Todd? Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth, one of the things that, um, we take into account is, um, first of all, the, the SIGS is used in all 50 states in the United States, uh, as well as multiple countries beyond the United States. Uh, so I, I believe when we checked, uh, the SIGS is used on five different continents. So what you find is there are different uh, definitions of what giftedness, uh, how giftedness is defined in different places. Uh, and then even beyond policy definitions, uh, people have uh, implicit or explicit uh, uh, conceptions of what giftedness means. So uh, in essence, everybody comes to the table poss possibly thinking they know what gifted is, but uh, you know, you could have two teachers next door and they both have different conceptions. Rather than try to get everybody on the same page, which we're not sure would be very effective even if we tried it, uh, the, the better approach which we've used in uh, the SIGS and SIGS 2 is to write the behaviors so clearly that uh, we just remove that from the equation. Don't think you know what, in other words, don't approach the rating scale thinking that you know what gifted is and you're just gonna rate whether you think this kid is gifted. Uh, that, that would be a terrible way to use the scale. Uh, the appropriate way to use the scale is to read very carefully what the, each item says and then ask yourself, does the kid exhibit that behavior about the same or more or less than uh, his or her peers? Uh, so uh, in that sense, we're, we're trying to sort of level the playing field regardless of what your conception is or your experience with giftedness or lack of experience with giftedness, you should be able to rate accurately because the items are written uh, meant to be written very clearly. I love that. <laughs> I think that that's exactly what we need. <laughs> um, and a question to piggyback off of something you said, Joel. Um, Cassandra asked, do you feel the rating system's language, and in parentheses, she had the Renzulli rating, can be difficult for parents to understand, thus hurting the students' chances? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I saw Todd do that and I thought that was clever. So I, didn't, I, didn't, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, let, me, let me show you something here. This is something Renzulli was a little concerned about too. Uh, and in those cases, he's developed, for, for those cases, he's developed a little offshoot of the, uh, the Scripsis, the, the, the scales for rating the behavioral characteristics of superior students. That's quite a mouthful. <laughs> so I just call it the Renzulli scales. Uh, he's developed a parent scale. And the, the things my child likes to do. And so remember, back to this talent idea, and you're looking for areas of passion. And, and most kids don't have a lot of passion for things they're not very good at. You know, So you're really, you're starting to pick up on areas of ability. 
uh, it's it's a much more simplified scale. The language is much more simplified. Um, you know, for example, uh, one of the things that that he does is get he he establishes the what the behavior is, but then he'll give examples. My child enjoys challenging puzzles, games, and other problems that require complex thinking uh, more than other children his or her age. And then the second part of that question is an example. Leanne solves the Sudoku puzzle in the, the newspaper for fun every day. Devin uh, prefers games that require a strategy for those that rely on luck. So for those of you who might be feeling like um, the, the Renzulli scales in particular, this is not a, a, a something that has come up with other instruments, but, but even Dr. Rizzulli felt like that, that there might be cases where uh, that language might be a barrier. It, it doesn't, it, 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 it's not every case, but in those cases where it was, there is an alternative instrument that he developed uh, uh, for that situation. Perfect. We have a question from Debbie, who's viewing with us tonight. She said, as my child moves into middle school and high school, I find that teachers aren't as close to students' ability as elementary school teachers. Is there anything a parent can do to advocate or support ongoing growth when a child may not reflect the high achieving gifted child at this age? So for these older students or teachers who are teaching these older students and they have a hundred and some students, it's very different than elementary ideas for how to best support those students. I think one of the one of the things that I would uh, certainly advocate is, um, you know, as, as much as possible, try to have record keeping that can follow kids. And, and I know that's not always uh, possible. Uh, I think the um, the phenomenon of kids in middle school uh, maybe appearing to underachieve compared to the way they performed in elementary school is uh, not new uh, nor limited to <laughs> any location. We, we generally see that uh, as kids are moving into adolescence, uh, their social lives are also uh, uh, changing as well. So uh, you, you sometimes see dips in performance. It's also the case that they're oftentimes encountering more rigorous content specific um, curriculum. Uh, so uh, one, of the, one of the things that I would hope to see in any uh, quality gifted program is the expectation that we measure student progress. Uh, I think that should be a part of any program that's part of the national standards, the NAGC programming standards. So whether it's not just about assessing a kid once uh, to see if that kid qualifies for gifted education, but we should be doing ongoing assessment to document student growth, particularly in those areas of strength where they're served by the gifted education program. Uh, so if that's not happening, I would try to, maybe that's something we could add, you could advocate with uh, the local uh, school district or the, the local building uh, because that should be uh, that should be part of a gifted education program, uh, documenting academic growth annually. Thank you. I think that's very helpful. Um, we have a couple more questions. One is uh, from Cassandra again. What would be the best rating profile that would help our movement to be more equitable? Would you recommend one over another for that specific purpose, or? I know you said there's um, webinars and a lot of information, so maybe this is a more complex question. But well, it it it, it I actually I think I probably have a, 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 a there are two okay, and and they they both have different purposes really. The Hope Scale was developed as part of a Jack Kent Cook Foundation grant. It is very short. It's eleven. Uh, I think it's 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 eleven questions. Uh, I I believe, um, and it really just tells you about. Mm, schoolhouse intellectual ability and then social sort of leadership uh, type skills. And so it's looking for more of a, um, does this child have the potential to be gifted or not? You don't get the kind of discrete data that you get, that you get with the SIGs or the SIGs too. Uh, but it, it, it shows almost, uh, if I can get back to a slide, um, I'll actually, I won't, I won't, I won't belabor it, but basically there are no mean differences or, or minimal mean differences among different populations of kids with the HOPE scale. It's, it's an incredibly equity focused instrument that identifies for giftedness as a general concept. Uh, what, what uh, Dr. Reiser, who is the developer and, and, and Dr. McConnell, who originally developed the SIGs and then Todd came, came in and did the, 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 the second edition, um, what that instrument does is give you really discrete information about those di specific different areas where mm -hmm. kids can exhibit talent. But again, as Todd said, you're getting minimal differences among the means of uh, scores among different populations of kids. So both of those tools are very powerful tools for equity. 
Todd, maybe you can. I, I completely agree, Joel. I, I love the hope scale and I know the developers of it. And I know they did a fantastic job with it and I've always loved the Renzuli scale. So, uh, I mean, I'm going to, I mean, certainly I've put a lot of uh, uh, work in over the last year and a half developing the, uh, the SIG too, but uh, those other scales are great as well. And they all follow the same principle that we believe teachers uh, are really good uh, judges of student behaviors if we give them the tools and the opportunity to make those ratings. Yeah, I would. I, I thanks for clarifying that about the Renzulli scale. I think the uh, the thing I wanted to uh, that we get into a little bit more. The, the Renzulli scale is sort of a, a a beast of a different, or what is it, a horse of a different color, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so you start off with four scales, which are very similar to maybe what you know you'd see with the SIGs or something like that. But this is really more of a talent development piece. Uh, let me show you what the, the, so these are the, the main scales, but then with the Renzulli scales, you come into boom, all of these discrete talent areas, artistic ability, dramatic ability, uh, different kinds of communication skills, the, the specific subject areas, even musicality. So in the, this, the purpose of this instrument is, is, is not so focused on uh, equity as much as it is talent identification, mm -hmm. not to say you couldn't achieve equity with it. It's just that I think the focus is a little different with that instrument. It's the reason I didn't mention it. I think that's very helpful. Um, we have a couple more questions and thanks for hanging with us. I know we started late and we're going a little late and thank you too for sharing. This has been a very helpful conversation with Tag T. Um, Sheila wanted to know, is SIGs available in Spanish? Yes, actually, uh, what we do is we provide a Spanish translation of it in the, the manual that you can use. Um, there's caveats with that because we haven't, we haven't standardized or normed it in Spanish, so you're using it. Um, you're using it without that kind of support data. Uh, obviously, it, it it should be fine, but we just don't have the the norms uh, with the Spanish version. I haven't established that. But yes, it is available. The other thing I would mention, and we're having we have this come up quite frequently. You've got districts that. You know, I've, I've been contacted by very large districts that say, well, we have, you know, 54 different languages spoken in the district, you know, and uh, do you provide translations? And I was like, no, we don't. But, but what we can do is work with you and allow you to do the translations for those populations. And, um, and we've worked with many districts to, to allow that. Perfect. It's true. It's not just Spanish. Mm -hmm. There are so many languages. That's awesome that you work with districts to help support that. Um, I think this is our last question Question that's relevant for you two that I saw come in on Facebook. Um, and I think they're referencing something that you didn't talk about tonight. So let me know if this isn't a fair question. But from Kim, she said, how would you compare the SIGs with the GES by Hawthorne? Is that a tool that you both are familiar with? I know the gifted rating scale that Pearson used to have and then it sold up to a... Uh, uh, it's sold up to a Canadian company, and I think they're maybe working on a revision of it, but that's Stephen Pfeiffer's gifted rating scale. I'm afraid I'm not familiar with the GES. Todd, do you know what, uh, do you know what that is? I'm trying to look. Gifted evaluation scale, I, I believe. Oh, okay. I, that's okay I'm, if it's not yeah. one that's in your wheelhouse. I'm not familiar with it, uh, so I, I would be uh, out of place to make sure. Uh, comments. But. Sure. Um, but I will say I defend the idea of rating scales. <laughs> <laughs> They're important. And I yeah. love, I think the quote of the night is our instruments shouldn't be a gatekeeper, but rather mm -hmm. talent scouts. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that thumbs it up, right? We need mm -hmm. uh, multiple instruments, like you said, where we can see process, IQ, achievement, product, mm -hmm. everything um, mm -hmm. to make this equitable. Um, we did. So Kim, who asked that question, uh, followed up with a second question. And I think this is a really good one that a lot of people might be wondering. If a district is using the COGAT to universally screen an entire grade level, at what point do you feel the SIGS is best utilized? Should we be doing it parallel with the COGAT, universally screening, post, pre? Where, does, where would you best say the use of these behavior skills? I, I, would, uh, I would use it... Um side by side or parallel. And, and the reason I say that, one of some of our validity studies uh, that we did with the 6-2, we were comparing uh, uh, ratings on the 6-2 uh, the with uh, COGAT scores. And, uh, and what we generally find is um, correlation values around 
um, I don't know, maybe point, you know, four five, point four eight. Uh, so, so what that uh, tells us is they are similar, but they're not so similar that they're capturing the same data. Uh, so uh, maybe they've got uh, somewhere along twenty, you know, twenty to twenty-five percent of the uh, the same variance that they're capturing. So what I would suggest is you're going to actually find uh, kids that uh, with the SIGs that may not show up in in the uh, uh, qualifying range on COGAT. Uh, and you may find some that score high on COGAT that aren't going to score high on SIGS. So if you want to maximize your search for potential, I would use them in parallel because I do think they're going to capture uh, slightly different data, uh, some you know performance data as well as uh, observation data. I think that's very helpful. I'm so thankful that we made it to Facebook Live tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, for hanging in there with us, those of you watching and our presenters who we were all sweating profusely behind the scenes trying to make it work and we finally got here. So we thank you for that and thank you for sticking with us um, a little past six tonight so that we could glean all of this important information from you. I think it's so important um, in the gifted world to have this conversation out there. Um, was there any last things you wanted to share or contact info or um, I know that they can find all of these resources at Proof Rock Press. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Elizabeth, I, I'd just like to say thank you for having us and Joel, thanks for inviting me to be a part. Um, we certainly look forward to the opportunity for NAGC to come to Colorado next year and we'll, we have very uh, high hopes that uh, our world will be allow us to have at least some uh, portion of that in person because we love coming to Colorado. So Yeah, we uh, would love to have you and hopefully it's not as snowy. <laughs> <laughs> as it is tonight here in Colorado. But um, again, we thank everyone for your patience hanging in there with us. Um, just a quick announcement. Next week, we have Dan Peters with us from the Summit Center, and he's going to be talking about perfectionism. So you're not going to want to miss that. And uh, hopefully all of our glitches are worked out and we can get to Facebook on time. But thank you so much. This was such a valuable conversation. Um, and we hope to hear back from you soon. So thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>